Hello, thank you all for coming out today. I wanna to talk to you about something near and dear to my heart, fungi. Now, I know the look you all are giving me, this dubious kind of evaluation of my sanity. Like, what kind of mushrooms could be interesting? Because that's what I first thought when in the summer after seventh grade, I first went to nature camp. Now, I was a pretty good student, but science was not my thing. If you'd given me a choice, I probably wouldn't have picked nature camp out of a group. However, my seventh grade earth science teacher saw something in me I'd never seen before. She saw potential for science. So she awarded me a full scholarship to a two-week environmental summer camp in the cool mountains of Southern Virginia. And it was there that I, two guys, Mason and Alex, introduced me to my lifelong passion and in the process gave me a lifetime neck problem because I was all of a sudden I was really interested in the forest floor and all of these fungi it held. But that's not what people usually see. Because when you think mushrooms, most people they either think that thing on their feet or the stuff on their pizza or those magic mushrooms. But there's so much more to fungi than foot fungus, portobellos, and hallucinogens. In fact, they're one of the most diverse kingdoms. Everything from amanatas to stinkhorns to puffballs. What we usually see is the top part of fungi, what mycologists call the fruiting body. But mushrooms are much more than what meets the eye. In fact, the majority of these organisms are their root network system called mycelium. Pictured here is a mushroom and then its roots. But mycelium doesn't just rest underneath a mushroom. It's a network that goes on for miles. It's estimated that under every footstep, there's 300 miles of mycelium. Notice the branching of the individual pieces called hyphae. Kind of looks like a spider web, right? But don't be mistaken. Mycelium isn't the root of a fungus. It is the fungus. Fungi only produce mushrooms to make and disperse spores for reproduction. While fungi perform the same jobs as our brain, liver, kidney, lungs, stomach, and so much more. Pictured here are two granite slabs that sat underneath my mother's straw bale gardens a few years ago. We saw on multiple occasions inky cat mushrooms pop up, but nothing really prepared us for what we saw underneath. The damage they did to the slab is astonishing. What seems so fragile and simple is powerful enough to break through and break down rocks and so much more. The first species I want to introduce you to are oyster mushrooms, by far my favorite fungus. Oysters are what we call a white rot, meaning they break down white, or brown lignin and leave behind white cellulose, two compounds that are found in wood and many living things. But it's more than just that thing on the decomposing log in the forest or the, your compost pile. It also breaks down hydrocarbon bonds, which are found in fossil fuels. In an experiment done by renowned mycologist Paul Stamets, Four piles of soil were drenched in petroleum and other fossil fuels. The first pile they designated their control, another one they put bacteria in, and another they put enzyme in, and the last one they put oyster mycelium in. Eight weeks later, they came back to find three nasty stinky piles, but the fourth pile, well, those glorious oyster mushrooms, they had broken down the carbohydrate bonds by producing peroxidase. They'd, left behind, they'd broken down those carbohydrate bonds into carbohydrates. These carbs, which had attracted insects, had also attracted birds, which had brought seeds, and thus a whole new ecosystem was created. The oyster mycelium had reduced the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons by 97%. It had gone from over 10,000 parts per million to less than 200. Oysters are also used in a technique called mycofiltration. Most conservationists use what's called the riparian buffer, which is just a fancy word for a bunch of plants placed along a stream bed to protect it from erosion and runoff. This whole idea is based off the fact that plant roots hold the soil together, a fact that's widely been accepted for decades. However, more and more we're discovering it's actually fungi who are responsible for this. See, fungi excrete their waste products from digestion in a glue-like enzyme that's more likely what's holding the soil together which is why more and more conservationists are adding mycelium to their riparian buffers, and with astonishing results. Because along with all of their ability to break down chemicals, as we saw with hydrocarbons and oyster mycelium, they also have a mesh-like structure that's perfect for filtering. Research conducted by that same mycologist, Paul Stamets, showed that three different fungal species reduced the coliform level of a stream 10,000 times in 48 to 72 hours. 
In rural areas, especially farm country, fecal E. coli runoff in the form of manure is a huge detriment to our aquatic ecosystems. So this has innumerable implications. But if that doesn't blow your mind, then let's cure cancer. When I first heard about mycology, this was the tidbit that snagged me. I, like many others, have lost loved ones to cancer, and the very idea that these tiny little organisms, which I'd only previously held disgust for, could save someone, that amazed me. One of the biggest problems with popular cancer treatments is the toll it does on your immune system. In some cases, even a common cold could kill you. Turkey tail is widely distributed throughout all of North America, Europe, and Asia, and has long been known to be an immune booster. In 2009, an intercollegiate study led by Dr. Lena Standish used turkey tail to enhance the immune system of women undergoing chemo radiation for breast cancer. One of the best indicators of the successfulness of this trial is an elderly woman who, before entering the trial, was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer. She was given mere months to live. In the trial, they gave her Taxol and her Septin, as well as eight turkey tail capsules a day. A year later, not only was she alive, she had no detectable cancer. But turkey tail isn't the only possible cancer solution. Another major contender is cordyceps, a fungi usually known for its crazy insecticide skills. Weirdly enough, cordyceps loves to attract and thus infect insects like ants and termites. It does this because the insects are ideal homes for mushrooms, although cordyceps is one of the few that utilizes that potential. The chitin found in their body is exactly what the mushroom needs for its cell wall. That's not even the weirdest thing about this mushroom. In the early 2000s, Cornelia Damore began studying cordyceps as a possible cancer medicine. She found that a compound in cordyceps called cordycepin interferes with protein synthesis, and thus, when used in a targeted application, could potentially stop the growth of tumor cells. It also promotes the production of white blood cells and reduces the chemo side effects on kidneys. But wait. That's not all. Ganoderma rishi is another fungi that has possible cancer curing properties. Similar to turkey tail and cordyceps, Ganoderma boosts the immune system and reduces chemo side effects. However, it also enhances liver detoxification, making it especially applicable to the treatment of liver cancer. Ganoderma, in addition, protects cellular DNA by promoting the production of white blood cells and inhibiting the activity of enzymes in tumor cells. So Ganoderma isn't just helping to treat the cancer you have, it attacks the problem at its roots by working to prevent more cancer from occurring. Ganoderma isn't just medicine, though. It's being used as a building material. Terraform 1 is using Ganoderma rishi mycelium, an organic material, to make a building block. If you remember, we talked about the structure of mycelium and its spongy flexibility. That same spongy flexibility makes it an ideal building material. Terraform starts by taking Ganoderma mycelium and putting it in an incubator with organic material. Over the course of 10 days, it grows, and then it's compacted. Lastly, they cover it in uh, recycled materials like aluminum, and then you have a building block. But they're not the only ones with the right idea. Ecovative is another company that's working to add mycelium into their production process, this time with packaging. Ecovative starts by taking mycelium and organic waste products, like, say, corn husk. They then grind the organic material into a good substrate, and then they put all of their mycelium and their organic agricultural waste products into a mold. Over the course of a few days, the mycelium grows, acting like a glue that holds the substrate together. Most packaging materials, like styrofoam, take hundreds of years, if ever, to break down. While Ecovative's mycofoam is not only flame retardant and waterproof, it's also 100% biodegradable. And Terraform's mycoform is more sustainable as production is pollution free and low tech in energy and cost effective since the material literally grows itself. <laughs> Last but not least, we have lion's mane. Lion's mane is obviously not your typical mushroom. It's what we call a toothed mushroom, meaning it has teeth rather than gills for dispersing spores. But that's not even the weirdest thing about this mushroom. More than a dozen studies have been done, mostly in Japan, on lion's mane's neurological properties. One in every three senior citizens and an estimated 5.3 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the US and the only one in the top 10 without a current treatment or cure. But what if it did? 
It all started in 1991 with Japanese scientist Dr. Kawagashi. He discovered two neurological growth factors in, ma in lion's mane. In 2009, scientists at Hukutu La Corporation studied patients with mild cognitive impairment. They were given 16, 20, 250 milligrams of, turkey, of lion's mane over the course of 16 weeks, which showed marked improvement in their cognitive function. And a similar study conducted on mice who had been infected with Alzheimer's causing protein plaque. They were given, lion's mane not only improved their ability to complete mazes, it also added a capacity to their brain, similar to curiosity with unfamiliar objects, that they didn't previously have. Lion's mane isn't just healing damage, it's growing new nerves and brain matter. If fungi are so amazing and can do so much for us, why aren't we worshiping them as our almighty savior? <laughs> Early 19th century mycologist William Hay coined the word fungophobia. He believed that this fear was rooted in British culture and not universally human, and therefore not instinctual or well-founded. Whether this distrust is justified, I'll leave you to decide. But I will point out that our unfortunate doubts in this kingdom have set us back thousands of years in mycological advancements compared to the Eastern world who embrace fungal species. I hope you all better understand just why we need fungi and what we can achieve when we take time to look beyond the surface. Because fungi are so much more than a pizza topping. They're a pioneer species from which all life stems. Without fungi, none of us would be here today. We often like to personify nature into Mother Earth, but if there's one species that's taking care of us in a parental way, it's fungi. I would go so far as to agree with Paul Stamets. The strength of an ecosystem is a direct measure of its fungal diversity. Thank you very much.